Well, good afternoon, everybody. Let me be the first one to uh, welcome you to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I'm Ellen McKenzie. I'm privileged to be the dean uh, of the school. Thank you for joining us today for what I think will be a very compelling conversation. One that prov will provide us great hope that we can make a difference in the fight against AIDS. But also, it will remind us that there is still much, much to be done. Importantly, we're going to we'll need to double down on our efforts if we're to meet the goals set out in the bold 10-year federal initiative championed by the NIH and the CDC and by our special guests with us here today, Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. John Brooks. Now, here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, we've been talking about the power of public health, the power that comes from doing the fundamental research and then translating that research into programs and policies that make a difference the power that comes from strong partnerships across disciplines, across public and private sectors, and across community, and the power that comes from advocating for evidence-based solutions at the state, local, and national levels. The fight against HIV AIDS exemplifies how a sustained commitment to these powers can make a true difference. Today's conversation will be facilitated by our own uh, Dr. Chris Byer the Desmond Tutu Professor of Public Health and Human Rights. Dr. Beyer, in my humble opinion, is a true public health hero, a researcher and a practitioner who is committed to solutions to some of the world's most challenging public health problems. He is a longtime HIV AIDS researcher with extensive experience conducting international collaborative research and training programs in HIV AIDS with a focus on key populations. He is also well known for his overriding commitment to securing health and human rights for all. As director of the Johns Hopkins Fogarty AITRP program, Dr. Byer uh, provided fellowships for over 1,400, and I'll repeat that, 1,400 international scholars in HIV, AIDS prevention, research, and treatment. Chris is one of the Bloomberg's most remarkable graduates. His successes in research and practice with a continuing and ongoing commitment from the top policy leaders at the CDC and the NIH make for a powerful combination and have helped bring us to where we are today on the cusp of ending the HIV epidemic in America and indeed across the world. <clears throat> now today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for AIDS Research known as CIFAR. CIFAR is a collaboration across the three Johns Hopkins schools in East Baltimore, the schools of public health, medicine, and nursing, and with support from the university through the office of the provost. Founded seven years ago, CIFAR is committed to ending the HIV epidemic through the promotion of transdisciplinary research, and importantly, very importantly, by training the next generation of <laughs> HIV AIDS researchers, both here in the US and abroad. The return on investment is quite clear. As just one example, HIV funding for junior investigators has risen from 7% of NIH funds from before CIFAR was established to 25% of all NIH research funding now. This has created a larger pool of well-trained and empowered HIV experts who in the past decade have accelerated the work to get us nearer to the necessary uh, solutions for this e epidemic and getting us to the goal that we're all striving towards. And while HIV impacts the health of populations worldwide, I'm particularly pleased that CIFAR has been on the forefront of supporting HIV research and programs here in our own city of Baltimore. Bloomberg School faculty are making a difference in participating in so many of the ending the HIV epidemic initiatives by collaborating with Baltimore city leaders and our state policymakers. This is a remarkable example of us working together to find programmatic and policy solutions that work across all levels of government to save lives millions at a time. I would like to close by offering a special thanks to CIFAR director, Dick Chason of the School of Medicine, and again to Chris Byer, who is the associate director of um, CIFAR. Thank you both for all you have done and you continue to do. And thanks to all of you for being here. Your determination and commitment to HIV is so criti critically important. Because of your work, our dream to end, end HIV is now on the horizon, and we hope coming true by 2030. So with that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Chris Byer, 
who will introduce today's guests. Chris? Well, thanks so much, uh, Ellen. And uh, on behalf of Dick Chason and myself, we really want to thank you for all of your sustained support uh, for the CIFAR. It really has made a difference. Um, so uh, we are delighted, uh, on behalf of the CIFAR, uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, special session. Uh, and with our special guests, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of NIAID, and John Brooks, the head of the HIV prevention program at the CDC. And just before I introduce them, I just want to make a few comments about why we think it's so important that academic research institutions like ours, like Johns Hopkins, uh, engage in the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative and really take on the roles that we, we think we can play uh, in, in helping to finally achieve uh, the end of the HIV epidemic. Um, I think before we, before we do that, we have to just acknowledge perhaps two or three fundamental truths uh, that you're going to hear about from both of our speakers today and that are really, I think, very essential to thinking about the tasks ahead. Um, and the first of those is that we have to acknowledge that the HIV epidemic in the United States, particularly the incidence of new infections in the U.S., has been stubbornly persistent. We had declines over a number of years, and we have basically been in a plateau with around 38,000 or so new infections now for a number of years. And so the first enormous goal that has been set by this initiative is a 75 percent reduction in new infections over the next five years. That is on a very different trajectory from where we are uh, and where we have been. So we have an enormous task ahead of us in primary prevention of HIV infection and in delivering the new science, the new technologies, again, that you're going to hear about from our guests, that really could achieve reductions in new infections, but we are going to have to really engage the folks uh, who are now at risk for HIV acquisition uh, if we're going to achieve those goals. The second challenge is that HIV has always been marked by health disparities, but as we have done better as a country uh, and over the last decade, the health disparities are getting all the more stark. So HIV is now very much geographically concentrated in the south and southeast. It's basically a swath of the country, as you'll see, that goes from Baltimore <laughs> down uh, all the way to Texas and across the south and southeast. So there's a geographic disparity. There is, of course, a marked racial and ethnic disparity with a concentration in African Americans, in Lat Latinx Americans, in Native Americans. And that is particularly stark for African American women and for African American and Latino men who have sex with men. So we have a concentration by race ethnicity and we have a concentration in vulnerable groups and people at risk. Um, we also, of course, have to deal with the emerging and quite different demography of the opioid epidemic and its impact on what we're seeing with new HIV clusters of infections, and really quite a different map that involves Appalachia and New England and the South and the Midwest. And finally, the third area that I, I think we've all been surprised about after 30 years of effort here and the tremendous advances in treatment and prevention is that HIV remains a very stigmatized condition, and the people who are both living with the virus or at risk for it are in very highly stigmatized groups. So there is intersectional stigma, and that uh, relates to racial and ethnic minorities in this country, that relates to sexual and gender minorities, to substance users, uh, but of course also just to the stigma around HIV infection itself. And the persistence of that stigma remains a very important barrier to achieving these essential goals that we want to achieve. So we have to deal with stigma, we have to deal with health disparities, and we have to deal with reducing new infections. And of course, that means both getting the new prevention technologies to people and also getting the Americans living with this virus uh, successfully linked to care and virally suppressed. The exciting thing to say, and you're going to hear a lot about this from our guests, is that we really do have the scientific and technical capacity to do this. And now the question is, are we going to be able to achieve that as a public health effort as a country? 
Uh, and I think particularly for the young folks in the audience and younger investigators, this is really going to be, for the next decade or two decades, the enormous implementation science technical challenge for, for your careers. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's enormously exciting. So uh, you're going to hear a lot of rhetoric about the end of AIDS. It doesn't mean the end of AIDS research. Don't worry about that. <laughs> There's a long way to go uh, to achieving these goals. Let me turn now uh, to a, a really uh, delightful honor and task, which is to introduce our first guest, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And Dr. Fauci, of course, is one of the architects of the Ending the HIV initiative. This is often called, as some of you will have heard this, a PEPFAR for the United States. And that perhaps isn't surprising because Dr. Fauci was also one of the architects of PEPFAR, <laughs> uh, which of course has been a world-changing global health uh, intervention, the single largest commitment to a disease by a government in human history, uh, and really something that, that uh, is enormously important. Dr. Fauci, uh, people always say uh, about Tony Fauci that he needs no introduction, but I think everybody needs an introduction. So uh, let, me, let me just go on for a moment and say uh, he is, of course, one of the most cited scientists in any field. Uh, he's a recipient of the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor that uh, the president can give. He's played an extraordinary role in maintaining over decades now the research and funding support for the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, effort, and for that, uh, all of us as investigators are deeply in his debt, but more importantly, everybody alive with HIV is deeply in his debt. It took 800 clinical trials to reach antiviral therapy uh, to be as effective as it is now. Without the sustained decades-long support of the NIH in funding that research, we would not be where HIV is a man manageable chronic condition, and that is just an extraordinary achievement, and it has saved literally millions of lives. I will just add one more thing, which is that uh, some of you may know I'm a past president of the International AIDS Society, and when you take on that task, uh, you get to give an award, and uh, it's called the IAS President's Award, and uh, so when, when that fell to me to make that decision, I had a short list of one person. <laughs> And so I would like to thank you, Dr. Fauci, for accepting <laughs> and for coming all the way to Durban, South Africa, to accept that award. It was a great honor uh, giving it to you. And without further ado, Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Chris, for that very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with here with you this afternoon to talk about the subject that's at hand here, is that's ending the HIV pandemic. And I'm going to talk about it from the standpoint of what I call from science to implementation. So this is the paper that uh, we uh, put together when we were describing uh, right after, actually, we, we submitted it right before the president made the announcement on February 5th, but it came out online essentially the next morning, and he was the print version describing the plan, which as was alluded to a moment ago, was a 75% reduction in new infections in five years and a 90% reduction in 10 years to diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond to outbreaks. You're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Dr. Brooks in a moment. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit more and flesh out what I refer to as the HIV vulnerability profile. Why did we feel that we could actually end the epidemic given what we have? It starts off with the population that we have as our vulnerable population, both demographically and geographically. So let's look demographically. You know the numbers. It's very prevalent here in Baltimore. 13% of the population of the United States is African American. Of the new infections, 43% are among African Americans, and 60% of those are among men who have sex with men, and 75% are young men who have sex with men. So as Chris said, we have a concentration of a vulnerable population. We also have a geographic concentration. 
When John Brooks and his colleagues at the CDC put together this map, it was stunning. There were 3,007 counties in the United States. And if you look at 38 of those counties, plus the District of Columbia, plus San Juan, that accounts for more than 50% of all the infections in the United States. That's extraordinary. 40 units out of 3,007 units had 50% of the population. So we had this plan. There's a number of in agencies involved. I'm going to focus just for a few minutes on what the NIH's role. And we were discussing this with some of the staff and the students a little while ago. We call it implementation science. The CDC and HRSA and others will be responsible for going out in and engaging in the community. Whether they're doing that correctly, which I'm sure they will, but how you make it even better from year to year will depend on implementation science. And that will be done through the Centers for AIDS Research, a prominent one of which is right here in Baltimore. If one looks at the map of the country and those red ribbons are for where the Centers for AIDS Research are, and the blue ribbons are where the AIDS Research Centers, which is mostly mental health, you can see an important overlap with some exceptions, like in Texas, which unfortunately doesn't have that, but we're going to be dealing with that by extending other CFARs there. We, went, uh, we rose to the occasion, as it were, of trying to get the CFARs, who were doing an extraordinarily good job in other aspects of HIV AIDS, a critical part of what we do. But we needed to supplement them to do that extra mile of getting involved in this extraordinary effort to end the epidemic. So we did 65 supplements to 17 CFARs. 36 of the 48 counties of high iron burden were involved with the CFARs. We collaborated with health officials, and we studied the optimal delivery of evidence-based intervention. I just had the pleasure of listening to two Hopkins people present work associated with the Hopkins CFAR the Baltimore Rapid Start Collaborative Project with Joyce Jones, and the linkage and retention and care upon release from the Maryland State Prison by Gene Anderson. If everything that's done here is as good as what I saw this morning, you guys are in really good shape. So let's get on to the scientific basis. So besides the implementation, I think we should not forget how we got to where we are now. And it really is the science that got us there, namely the scientific basis for even our ability to implement the program. So let me talk about that for a few minutes. We have HIV treatment and prevention toolkits that have accumulated, as Chris said, over decades of research with basic research and clinical trials, including the drugs on the left-hand toolbox and the prevention modalities on the right hand. Where has that brought us? I began taking care of HIV-infected individuals in the fall and winter of 1981, before it was called AIDS, before we knew what it was. And at that time, the patients that I admitted to my unit at the NIH had a median expectancy of about a year, which means, as you know, 50% of your patients are dead in one year, and following them, about 95% of them were dead in two to three years. If you look now today, if patients come into the same clinic, which I should have actually been having rounds today, but I'm here with you in Baltimore, but that's okay. If a patient came in who was reasonably newly infected and I put them on an antiretroviral combination, I could look them in the eye and honestly tell them they would live an additional 50 plus years, which would give them almost, not quite, but almost a normal life expectancy. What have been the returns of that? In the 20 years from 1995 to 2015, almost 10 million deaths were averted, almost 8 million infections were averted, and we saved $1.05 trillion. For every dollar spent, $3.5 in benefits were realized. What about deaths? A 55% reduction in death from 2005 to 2018. We've had some game-changing scientific advances. The one that's linked them 
has been the concept, as simple as it may seem, but we didn't realize it, is that treatment equals prevention in two ways. Treatment as prevention. The iconic HPTN 052 trial, which showed in zero different couples that if you start therapy early in an individual who's infected, as opposed to waiting until the guidelines triggered it at the time, guidelines did not say everyone should be infected, should be treated, you decrease by more than 95% the likelihood you would transmit to your sexual partner. We followed up five years later, and we started to look at the relationship between viral load and the chance of transmitting. And there was a strong suggestion that if you were below detectable level, that you wouldn't transmit. Very few people believed that, so we had to prove it. We did three studies, partners one, partners two, and opposites attract, and to our amazement, our very positive amazement, out of more than 150,000 condomless sex acts, not one single linked transmission, which allowed us to say something with scientific basis that we were hesitant to say before, that actually treatment does equal prevention and undetectable does mean untransmittable, a very important concept. The next was pre-exposure prophylaxis. One pill containing two drugs, if taken optimally and consistently, was more than 99% effective in preventing sexual transmission and acquisition of HIV. So if you put those two things together, treatment is prevention and pre-exposure prophylaxis, and take a deep breath and think about that for a minute, theoretically, if you put everybody on treatment, or almost everyone, and put all at-risk people on PrEP, theoretically, you could end the epidemic tomorrow, really. But we don't live in a theoretical world. We live in a real world. And the way you make that bridge of that gap is by implementation. And that's what it's all about, and that's what you guys are going to be doing. Now, in order to do that, We've also got to optimize this two kits that I spoke of in two ways, maximal implementation. Why do we need maximal implementation? Let's look globally, not just the United States. 23 million people are receiving antiretroviral therapy. Great news. Challenging news, almost 15 million people who should be on therapy are not on therapy. That has led to a very, very modest, in fact, even less than modest, reduction in incidence globally. In fact, there's been less than a 2% annual decrease in incidence since 2010. So as Chris said, although we're going down, we've kind of plateaued a bit, which is why we put the plan together. Retention in therapy is also challenging. If 100% is the day you go on therapy, 48 months later, only 60% of people are still on therapy. You're not gonna end the epidemic that way. Utilization of PrEP, the 2020 UN target, says that three million people should be on PrEP. There's only about 380,000 people as of last month who are on PrEP. Now, can we overcome those implementation gaps? Some groups have actually been successful, particularly in San Francisco with their rapid and treat all program in which they were aggressive in going into the community, identifying people, putting them on therapy immediately, if they're at risk, putting them on PrEP immediately and following them up very closely, resulting in a rather dramatic decrease in new diagnoses in San Francisco. You're probably gonna hear from, from uh, John Brooks in a bit that New York is doing the same thing. Governor Cuomo would decide, listen, if San Francisco can do it, New York can do it. <laughs> and in fact, it has actually gone down. We in DC, in collaboration with the DC PEPFAR program and the DC Department of Health, have tried to mimic what was being done in San Francisco. And again, the new diagnoses have gone down dramatically in my city, of Washington, D.C. Now, in addition to implementation, you need to develop new and improved tools. 
Why? Because we have to make treatment and prevention more user-friendly for people. Because as much as strange as it seems, they don't optimally utilize that. So there's two ways of developing new uh, improved tools. The first is the arena of treatment. Okay, so how do you improve treatment? There are a couple of ways. The goal is to try and get people off daily ART. A few ways to do that. You can eradicate the virus. I'm not gonna spend any time talking about that. That's highly aspirational. Not impossible, but I wanna concentrate on ending the epidemic before I get too concerned about eradicating the virus, with all due respect to attempts at eradicating the virus. What we can do to make things user-friendly is long-acting antiretroviral. It is amazing how people are much more amenable to receive an injection every couple of months rather than a pill every day. That's almost counterintuitive, but it's the truth. There's no doubt about that. There are a number of studies starting off with one monthly and then go to one every other month of an injectable antiretroviral such as cabotegravir plus rupivirine. Another way to avoid daily antiretroviral therapy is broadly neutralizing antibodies. There are about 200 broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been isolated and identified from HIV-infected individuals. We have now used them in humans to try and replace antiretroviral therapy. We did a study from my lab together with the University of Pennsylvania in a single antibody gave it as a passive transfer and saw a significant delay in the rebound of virus. Michelle Nutzensvig and others have done a combination of two antibodies. Where are we going with this? The ultimate goal or end game is about every six months to have somebody get a passive transfer of antibody and never have to take an antiretroviral drug. So you come into clinic once every six months with a long-acting antibody and that's your antiretroviral therapy. What about prevention? How are we gonna improve prevention? We can improve pre-exposure prophylaxis. The same fundamental principle, by long-acting PrEP. Either art-based PrEP, and we have two good studies, one in about 4,500 men who have sex with men and transgender women in multiple countries, the same principle, testing whether cabotegravir as an injectable could actually be as good as or better than Travada. Another study in Sub-Saharan Africa in 3,200 women. For those of you who were at the International AIDS Society meeting in Mexico City, there was a presentation of an implant that gave levels of drug for one year that would be predictive of being suppressive to prevent infection. If we could get an implant to stick into someone one year worth, that is gonna be a true game changer. The other is getting back to the broadly neutralizing antibodies. As I mentioned, there's so many broadly neutralizing antibodies. They're being used in a study now, both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the United States and South America as a preventive measure. With a long-acting one, if you can actually prevent HIV by having someone with an intermittent infusion of an antibody, again, in Southern Africa and in South America and even the United States, people would rather have an injection or an infusion than taking a pill every single day. And finally, there's the issue of vaccine. We're talking about ending the epidemic and I think we can do it before we get a vaccine. But if we want a durable end to the epidemic, I think we're gonna have a vaccine together with the things that I've just been speaking about. Very quickly, there have been two major pathways. The first was in to empirically test a number of vaccines. We did that without success for a number of years. And then in 2009, we had a hit. And the hit was an, uh, a, a pox vector prime and a protein boost in the famous now Thailand study, RV144, which gave a 31% efficacy. 31% is an interesting signal, but it's not good enough for prime time. But what it allowed us to do was to amplify that because we knew what the correlative immunity is, increase the strength, the breadth, and the durability. And as we speak today, we are doing that 
in three major trials in Southern Africa and in South America. The first is HVTN 072. We launched it three years ago this month, and the data will likely come out around 2021. This is very much mimicked against RV144. Pox virus prime, protein boost only now with an adjuvant. Then we took it a little further and a study that was started two years ago this month, and that is the Imbicoto trial, which is a quadrivalent different vector, an AD26 vector with a mosaic prime and a protein boost. And then the third one that just got started a couple of months ago is the Mosaico trial, which is again an AD26 vector with a mosaic prime and also a mosaic boost. That's taking place not in Southern Africa, but in South America and the United States. And finally, the thing that's highly aspirational, but a, a lot of elegant science going on, is assuming a correlate. And if the assumption being that broadly neutralizing antibody is what we need to induce, there's a problem, because the body doesn't like to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. It makes a lot of them, but only after a person him or herself has had the virus for two years or longer. But the antibodies have done something for us for vaccine. They've identified at least six or seven neutralizing epitopes, namely that protein component that the antibody binds to. So now the challenge is to take those neutralizing epitopes, put them in the form of an immunogen, and try and induce a broadly neutralizing antibodies and a lot of studies are going on right now. So what about a vaccine? How good is good enough? I already told you 31% is not good enough. I don't think there's a chance in the world we're gonna get a 98% effective HIV vaccine like we have for measles. But I'll settle for a 50 to 60% effective vaccine together with non-vaccine preventive modalities. In fact, Alison Galvani did a model and showed that if you had a 50% effective vaccine, even if you did status quo and didn't improve anything else, you could dramatically impact the epidemic. So on my last slide, to just summarize what I'm saying, is that we have an enormously effective toolkits for both prevention and treatment. We need to maximally utilize them, we need to maximally implement them, and we need to add new treatment and prevention modalities that are both user-friendly and hopefully like a vaccine game-changing. If we do that, we will end the epidemic in Baltimore, we will end the epidemic in the United States, and we will end the epidemic globally. Thank you. And he's an extraordinary speaker, too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. That really was inspirational and also lays out, I think, a lot of the, the science that many of the younger investigators here are going to be engaged in going forward. So that's just enormously helpful. Um, please hold on to your questions for Dr. Fauci. We're going to have time for a Q&A uh, with both speakers uh, at the end uh, of Dr. Brooks's presentation. And uh, by the way, C-SPAN uh, is recording this. So if you want to be on television, uh, come up with a good question. <laughs> So um, it now is my, uh, my honor to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. John Brooks, who's a medical epidemiologist with the CDC. Um, and uh, John has had really a, an extraordinary career at the CDC in HIV prevention, but also uh, he did the uh, epidemiologic intelligence service training there and then has led a number of other efforts uh, for the CDC. He was the CDC team lead for the response to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, which many of you will remember was an enormous um, uh, public health challenge in addition to humanitarian challenge. Uh, he also led the CDC teams on SARS uh, and during the anthrax uh, challenge that we had some years ago. Um, he has a medical degree from what we call here the other H, Harvard. Um, <laughs> we don't hold that against you. We're, we're, we're welcome, uh, welcome Harvard folks. Um, and then uh, did his clinical training at Harvard uh, and then uh, was on the faculty at Emory before, uh, before going over to the CDC. Um, the CDC, of course, is one of the uh, absolutely key 
uh, federal agencies engaged in the ending the HIV epidemic. It's a partnership uh, with, with the NIH and with several others, Indian Health Service and SAMHSA and HRSA. Uh, but the CDC plays these extraordinarily important roles, as we all know, in disease control and surveillance uh, uh, and in working with the municipalities, the cities and states and counties uh, that are really going to be the front lines for ending the HIV epidemic. So that's why it's so important to have the CDC here with us today. And John, over to you. So I've got to raise this up just a little bit to make sure you guys can hear me, and then let me move this over to the right presentation. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Lo and behold, there we go. Well, thank you, first of all, for coming to this. Thank you also to the CIFAR organizers for the opportunity and the School of Public Health uh, for the invitation to speak today. It's terrific being able to speak after Tony, who did this beautiful job setting up the science behind what we know is going to work to end HIV in America and worldwide. But as he also pointed out, putting a plan into action is not as simple as it sounds, and that's where the money really lies in the future, I think, for this epidemic uh, plan. So. What I want to do today is walk through with you some of the um, details around our plan to action. Uh, and I first want to explain that I have no financial affiliations to disclose. And note that I'm going to give a brief background regarding some of the key considerations that informed the philosophy of ending the HIV epidemic initiative. And then review some of the new opportunities afforded by the initiative, detailing a uh, couple of uh, innovative solutions and highlighting persistent challenges for the three pillars, diagnose, treat, and prevent. Let me first remind folks that since uh, we've been living with HIV in America for too long, over 700,000 Americans have lost their lives to HIV since we first started keeping count in 1981. And right now, the US government spends $28 billion annually to take care of HIV infection and to prevent HIV infection. That's an uh, enormous amount of money that we shouldn't necessarily be having to spend. And as I'll point out in a moment, but as both uh, Chris and Tony pointed out uh, before, we have not seen a substantial decline in the number of new infections each year for a couple of years now. And if we did nothing for the next 10 years, 400,000 Americans will become infected with HIV infection. So <clears throat> we've made enormous strides, as I'm sure all of you are, are well know, uh, in reducing uh, the impact of HIV and new infections. But progress is stalled, as illustrated by this figure at the bottom of the slide from the Centers for Disease Control, looking at incidents by year. And it's not only that new infections have stalled somewhere between 38 and 40,000, but there also are now some very significant threats out there to our success, not least of which is the resurgence in non-sterile injection drug use, which is ramping up across the country and beginning to affect populations of people who we didn't consider at risk of HIV previously. And I'll also raise the issue of complacency. Many people think HIV is taken care of in this country, or they think that it's not my job to test somebody, that's somebody else's job. And that's something we really have to work on to make this initiative work. And so before us is this unprecedented opportunity to end the HIV epidemic, and as Dr. Fauci pointed out, with the most powerful tools in history. So what were the epidemiologic principles that led us to the figures of 75 and 90% reduction over 10 years, and how are we going to do it? <clears throat> so basically, in any epidemic, the first step is you want to reduce the prevalence of persons capable of transmitting the infection, Get them all in, getting those people who are infected all onto treatment so they can't pass it on to others. And then our goal is to ach achieve an incidence of less than 1 in 100,000 Americans. That's the World Health Organization's definition for an ongoing epidemic in the absence of be being able to eradicate it. And what happens is over time that eventually deaths that people experience at the end of their natural life exceed new infections. And from that point forward, your prevalence starts to decline. So we pull together that there were four principal means that we needed to do this, things that are very familiar to people who work in any form of infectious disease. You need to diagnose everybody who's got it, treat those who've got it effectively, approach those who don't have it but are at risk and offer them means of preventing getting the infection themselves, and then keep an eye on where their hot spots or clusters of disease occurring so that you can treat them and eradicate them as rapidly as possible. 
Now, some people ask, isn't 75% an ambitious goal for the first five years? And let me just show you that there are people doing this already. There's just, just a little bit north of us here in New York City. As you probably are aware, the governor and the, of the city and the mayor of the state kicked in some extra funding to the state's annual budget. And they have a very auspicious goal of over the five years of their epidemic um, plan to reduce new infections in New York City by 70, 75% or to reach a new goal of 750. These are data from their plan most recently, but today's Wall Street Journal has the next number for 2018, and they're continuing in this trajectory. So they're doing well. So we think, granted, the whole country is not like New York City, but this is a combination of what's possible and what's ambitious. So we think it's something we can do. I want to remind folks that this is a cross-HHS agency initiative. Often people think of NIH and CDC when they think about HIV. HRSA is a very large player. And the, through the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, leaders from each of these offices, CMS, SAMHSA, Indian Health Service, NIH, HRSA, and CDC have been brought together and envisioned this plan and are moving it forward. Federal action to date, just to remind folks that since the president's uh, announcement in February, a number of uh, things have happened. One of the large ones are these main implementation grants to do the work that we are laying out that are going to be going out uh, or have already gone out for application from CDC, HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, HRSA's Bureau of Primary Care, which is going to be deeply engaged in both distributing PrEP to folks as well as testing people much more regularly and the Indian Health Service. Um, as Tony alluded to, the CFAR and ARC grants have already gone out and a number of them have landed here and we heard as mentioned before some remarkable work that's being done here today. Three cities received what we call jumpstart funds, $1.5 million over the next, over, well starting, this was, this was in July, but it was over six months from July, so by year's end uh, this year to show some very early, that you can achieve some early success with infusion of capital and some other resources. One of those cities is Baltimore. The PrEP program, you've heard probably about a PrEP program due, um, that was uh, made possible by a donation uh, to the Department of Health and Human Services. This is going to go online, we hope, the first week of December. Um, and we look forward to folks being across the country being able to access it. This program will be open to anyone looking for PrEP for a person who's uninsured. And then finally, we've put out EHE planning grants. These are, are being uh, administered by CDC, HRSA, and SAMHSA. And I just want to point out that the purpose of these grants is not to reinvent the wheel. We know that there are many places across the country that have long-standing bodies that have been helping communities decide how to apply prevention and treatment funds. And ending the epidemic efforts are already underway in many places, so it's not an entirely new idea. We want to use this opportunity, as Chris alluded to, to galvanize people, bring them together, and refocus the plans they have and align them with the four pillars we've described, focusing on local solutions because that's where things work. And with a particular emphasis, which we haven't stressed as much as we should have before, but are really bringing now, on getting the local community involved. We want people affected by HIV being part of these planning committees, as well as populations and organizations not previously engaged. We need to get the next generation of people on board to move this forward. So now let me talk about the three, what I wanna talk about now is a little bit about three pillars, diagnose, treat, and prevent, and some of the opportunities that we have, some innovative ideas that I've seen recently, and then some of the challenges that we're gonna be facing. So, Early diagnosis is absolutely essential to ending the HIV epidemic in America. You can't get treatment unless you know you have the infection. Unfortunately, we're not doing a great job around that right now. Over half of people newly diagnosed have been living with the infection for three years, 25% um, for as long as seven years, and of people recently diagnosed, seven out of 10 in the year prior to their diagnosis passed through the healthcare system yet weren't offered HIV testing. So that's a tremendous missed opportunity. And why is this so important? Well, first, we need to get people diagnosed early for their own health. Still, 20% of people today diagnosed with HIV infection present with either a CD4 cell count less than 200 or with an opportunistic infection. And if you haven't seen an OI recently, please come down to Grady Hospital. We've got plenty of them. Secondly, as Dr. Fauci mentioned, un undetectable is untransmittable. People who um, suppress their viral load, have effectively no risk of sexually transmitting the infection. And that's another reason it's important to find people who are either out of care and not suppressed or don't know their infection yet, because we estimate 80% of new infections are from these persons who haven't had the benefit of full HIV and effective care. 
So this is really some great opportunities for us with this initiative. We can begin to do some things we've wanted to do for a long time. We're going to be asking places to work hard to routinize HIV testing as standard of care and to make it simple. That's been a barrier. Um, one of the things we really want to push is automatic order entry systems that automatically order a test for a person when they come in and have no evidence of prior testing. It sounds, it's difficult, but it can be done, and there are many examples in the literature of places that have done it successfully, and we'd like to help fund more efforts to do that. We also want to establish repeat testing strategies for people who are at risk, who need to be screened on a regular basis. That's another opportunity we can begin to really work on. And then I also want to talk about expanding access to HIV testing, meeting people where they are. You know, we ask people to come to us to get tested. But we really need to now think about other methods, in particular self-testing, bringing it to them, and to tweaking those approaches for the different populations. How you want to test MSM is going to be different than how you want to test people who inject drugs. So let me share with you some data from a study that was published this Monday from some folks at CDC and Emory looking at what you can do with self-testing. This is a 12-month longitudinal study. They divided people into two groups, one-to-one -one randomized. 2,600 roughly MSM were attracted to participate from an online banner on Grindr or music sites. Um, and then they were if they were enrolled in the intervention group, they were given four self-tests that they, and, and then baseline surveys they had to complete. And then they would be um, interviewed again every three months, so four times over the 12-month period, at which, at each point, they could then replenish those test kits. What I want to point out here is that they also could share those test packages with people in their social network. They got extra tests so they could, we, didn't say this explicitly, they weren't told to share them, but they got the extra test, and if they were, wanted to share them, we said, sure, that's fine. So let me show you what the results are. Study, by the way, was the evaluation of rapid HIV self-testing among MSM pro project, uh, e-stamp. So on the top line are data from all participants, and on the bottom line are data from those who were first-time testers. 17% of people in the study were first-time testers. So first, take a look at new diagnoses, comparing people who engage in the self-testing protocol I just described versus those who were told just, up, oh, thanks for rolling in the study, go out and get tested three, four times the next year. You got substantially more uh, new diagnoses. And look at the social network. These 1,300 persons were able to engage almost 2,200 persons with an infection, uh, a positivity rate almost equivalent to what the self-testers got. So they were ambassadors, if you will, for testing, reaching the people that we wanted to reach and who may not have wanted to come in to be tested. We also doubled the number of first-time testers. 17% of people had never tested before. We know that going to a doctor or going to a test center is a barrier for some people. But almost all of the self-testers actually tested versus about half of the control folks. And what I really thought was interesting is in both groups, repeat testing was very was substantially greater than in controls. So this at-risk group of people, MSM, who are sexually active, who we want to be tested, let's say four times a year, were basically beginning to do that more so than those in the control group. So I think this is an extraordinarily promising uh, opportunity. Challenges, just want to reemphasize re this complacency issue that, you know, testing doesn't start, I'm not responsible for testing, da 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 da, you know, or that the epidemic has ended, I don't have to worry about it, that's somebody else's job, we got to change that. We also um, need to really build our technical capacity and the healthcare leadership to implement automated screening. You need champions in different healthcare settings as well as different medical organizations to say this is the way to go. And I will also lastly note there is currently only one FDA approved home test. And we would like to see more and we're working with FDA but presently we only have one. Let me talk a little bit about treatment. As you know, um, we do an okay job, not a great job at getting people virally suppressed in America. The big drop-offs are with receipt and care and with viral suppression. We want to see expanded rapid engagement, retention and care, meeting people where they are, and rapidly detecting uh, people who have possibly disengaged. One of the ways we do that is through data and care, a model where HIV surveillance data are used to identify people who may be out of care. But learning that somebody's missed a CD4 cell count maybe a couple of times in six months, takes a long time. Could we move this back to get to people earlier? What about a pharmacy-based intervention? These are data that appeared online today um, from a group in Detroit looking at re refill of pharmacy prescriptions as a means of identifying people earlier and then working with the provider of public health to go out and find that person. Look at what they found. First of all, it took 92 uh, two staff on the D2C, the standard of care arm, to find 92 people versus one person to find 195. 
They in the people who use pharmacy data, they found more people, more accepted linkage to care, and it was a lower intensity of practice. It took 41 minutes per person in standard of care versus 15 minutes in this pharmacy thing. So this is not necessarily intended to be a replacement for data to care, but this may be a very inviting adjunct of a way to move um, really Im improve our capacity to capture more people. I also want to note that in terms of tr uh, treatment, one of the big barriers is managing people who have disorganized lives. You know, mental health, substance use, incarceration, but also competing demands. A lot of people can't come to see us because we hold office hours when they work. And that's hard. <laughs> uh, lastly, about prevention. Um, first, hope, uh, focusing on pre-exposure prophylaxis. You're probably aware that about 1.1 million Americans are estimated to need PrEP less than 20% in America are receiving it. And although from a study published this summer, we've seen uh, large increases in the awareness of PrEP and actual use of PrEP among MSM, there remain important uh, racial and ethnic disparities. In this uh, diagram in 2017, the white participants reached that over 35% taking, but not the African American and Latinos. So we really need to work on this. We need to increase PrEP to reach underreached populations, engage primary care in PrEP. That's going to be something the Bureau of Primary Care does, and also begin to innovate and disseminate new models for PrEP to increase access for patients and share the burden. I just want to show here, these are an enormous number of new ideas that are coming up, how to get PrEP to the people. Um, with, through the end of the epidemic initiative, we're increasing consumer demand expanding training capacity for primary care, and there's a PrEP warm line now that you can call a 1-800 number to get advice on how to administer PrEP. California is looking at putting PrEP into pharmacies. It's already, Walgreens is in this game. And then interbased access. How many of you have ever seen these interbased ways of getting PrEP online? It's pretty amazing. You know, these, these really could work in the future. They're convenient, discreet, highly acceptable, and teleprep may work beautifully in rural areas like um, Louisiana and Iowa, where they've got programs in place that are working now. I won't talk about all of these formulations, but I want, the point I wanted to make here is Tony showed us that there are these great new formulations and new agents coming along, and they're great for treatment. They're also great for PrEP. <laughs> and we look forward to the benefit of those working in PrEP as well. Um, persistent challenges, one of the biggest ones is identifying people who need PrEP and engaging them. How many people, how many times you've had a doctor say, my patient's not that kind of person, they don't need PrEP, or the patient not recognizing that I'm a person who needs PrEP. We've got to help people understand who's at risk and why they're at risk, and understanding what consumers want. There's been a lot of research about what are the preferred methods overseas, not so much in this country yet. Also, I want to touch on syringe service programs. I pointed out that we've seen uh, increases in um, uh, we, we've been concerned about injection drug use again, uh, in part because of the Scott County outbreak. And this was a figure we created showing where we thought there might be real concern about new infections among persons who inject drugs. And over the last three years, we've seen clusters in these areas. So we're concerned that this is a real threat, pushing back on the progress we've made. Looking at the number of new infections, however, attributable to injection drug use, at least at the time of our last surveillance document, we haven't seen an overall increase. But there are some worrying trends. If we do sub-analyses and we look by race, by age, and by location, we are seeing what seem to be some early upticks among whites, young people, and living in rural areas. And those are places where we know a lot of the risk is of people who aren't necessarily perceiving themselves traditionally as being at risk for HIV infection. We really need to develop integrated models of harm reduction. SSPs need to be more than just a place to get needles. They need to be a place to get comprehensive care. We need to tell people about the community benefit, frame everything in terms of cost savings, and develop innovative ways of delivering. I'm just going to skip this real quickly to point out that in Scott County, this has worked. By integrating a syringe service program with access to MAT, we were able to drive down HIV infections. In green are number of people receiving, um, daily number of people receiving uh, syringes that stayed nice and stable, and infections came down, but we didn't really begin to take them away until we got people more and more engaged into uh, addiction care. That's the blue lines going up. Um, we got to tell public. We got to tell the public why syringe service programs are good for them. There are a lot of reasons why they're good for them, but this is an opportunity for the anthropologists and social scientists in the room to work with your CFAR to do some research to show that you know these things don't increase crime 
they, put, they don't put public safety at risk, and they are too cost, that they, some people say these are too costly with no real benefit on, uh, no big return on my investment. Well, that's just simply not true. And this is some work done by folks here in Hopkins, published I think earlier this week as well, um, looking at what the cost benefit of syringe pro service programs were in Baltimore and in Philadelphia. And they estimated that in Philadelphia, the return on investment was $234 million per year. That's a lot of money that could be used for some really good purposes. So don't, you know, this is the kind of work we need. Money speaks to power. And if you can show people, and I don't mean to sound mercenary, but if you can show people the benefit to their wallet, that will drive them to what you want them to do. I'm just going to note syringe serv <laughs> vending machines. Um, how many of you all are aware that Las Vegas now has syringe service vending machines? Well, they do, and we think that's a great thing to explore. Um, challenges, there's always going to be uh, community and political resistance as well as legal barriers. We're facing those in many places. And we also, many of our services are siloed. We were talking earlier today about the fact that infectious disease doctors don't know a whole lot necessarily about administering MAT, but they need to. And that's medication-assisted therapy. We also know that people on the addiction side don't test their patients for HIV routinely and may not know who to refer for hepatitis C care. So we've got to kind of bridge those gaps. So just in my last words, I want to remind folks, this really is an extraordinary opportunity. There are challenges and risks, but ending the HIV epidemic in America is possible working together. And in the words of my um, boss, Dr. Bob Redfield, I want people to think about being disruptively, not destructively, disruptively innovative, because that's what we're going to need to make this end. Now is the time. Thank you very much. So we should sit over here. Well, thanks so much, John. That was just marvelous. And uh, sorry? You do. I love your slides. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we now have some time uh, for questions for our speakers. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have mobile mics, but we already have somebody at the mic. So please, go ahead. Ah. Is it on? Thanks for those amazing presentations. Uh, I can't wait to show them to students. I wanted to um, ask if you might be willing to talk about adolescence and how the um, four-pronged approach you're talking about should be um, rolled out with young people? Okay, sure. Uh, adolescents are extraordinarily high-risk group for HIV infection. In fact, they're one of the few groups where we're seeing infections going up, particularly among, uh, specifically among Latino and MSM youth. So coming up with solutions for them is important. I think all of these pillars apply to youth. Um, the one where they're, the one that I would want to highlight mostly is probably pre-exposure prophylaxis. You know, we got to help, help young people recognize that they're at risk. And for those, I'm sure many of you know what a challenge that is when dealing with minority communities in particular, or where I live in the South, communities where there's a lot of other social stigma associated with what they're doing, but also provide them the medication. It's now FDA approved for persons 35 kilograms, I believe that's 71 pounds or less. There's not an age limit. So you we should feel fine to give it to those folks. One of the other challenges is going to be able to provide it to them in a way that doesn't um, out them. You know, a lot of folks are on their parents' insurance plan under the age of uh, 26, and you want to ensure uh, that folks can have access to that without that inadvertent disclosure happening. And a lot of local jurisdictions are working on ways to do that, and we look, look forward to hearing more about those successes. That's going to be one of the interesting issues about what I said on one of the first slides about implementation science. And implementation mm -hmm. science sees if you're doing things right, and what's clear that what works for men who have sex with men may not be the same for transgender women, may not be the same for African Americans versus whites, may not be the same for adolescents. Exactly. Because adolescents are clearly a risk population that are very different from the others. So that's one of the nuts we have to crack is understand how to best implement in the adolescent population. So it's a really good question. You can hit Sarah and then Joanna. Is that the Hi, thank you for your presentation. I come from a state health department background and helped New Jersey write the first iteration of their Ending the Epidemic Plan. What we came up time and time again looking at our plan and looking at other states' plan is HIV criminalization in the United mm -hmm. States. 33 states and two U.S. territories currently, currently criminalize the transmission of HIV unknowingly. And this is highly stigmatizing, it's discriminatory, and it prevents people from getting tested. 
I'm wondering if there are any plans within the federal epidemic plan to address HIV criminalization. Well, the, 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 the plan, first of all, let me say, and I'm sure John would say the same thing, I am completely against any criminalization yep. of HIV at all. Uh, that's number one. Number two, this is a, a, a federal plan. The criminalization is all at the local level. So I don't think you're, you're going to be able to see something to come from the federal government about a decriminalization, because they're all local, even though yeah. many of us in the field are clearly yeah. very much against that, because that is really part of stigma almost. Uh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joanna. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm a doctoral student here at Hopkins. So I have uh, two questions. One, the first one being about PrEP um, and kind of talking about, uh, you know, your thoughts on medical mistrust surrounding mm -hmm. PrEP. But can I think um, in working here at Hopkins, I work on a study where we have participants and we ask them about PrEP and some of the comments are, we hear direct mistrust about, you know, what is it and the mm -hmm. fact they had to have, you know, this prolonged treatment of it. So I have a huge question about that. And secondly, when it comes to the treatment pillar of, um, you know, this, this whole initiative, um, what are your thoughts about, you know, how do you better have collaborations between people of different sectors? So a lot of the times, especially when you talk about people who have these, you know, other uh, competing priorities of mental health or housing or anything like that. So, I mean, that kind of takes initiatives that are kind of just outside of yeah. this HIV-specific initiative to really hit at this ending the epidemic initiative. Yeah. So I have those two overarching okay. questions. Great. All right. So with regard to uh, PrEP, I think you uh, really raised an important issue, which is the there is medical mistrust, I think. Uh, we can't deny that it takes place. It's a real barrier to many of the things we want to do in medicine, but it's particularly critical for us in this initiative. Um, not just here in Baltimore, but where I work in Atlanta, it comes up all the time. I, it's, you know, how do you address stigma? How do you address this? I don't have an easy solution, but I will tell you some of the things I've seen that work. Having a key opinion leader in the, in the jurisdiction, in a town, like if we had somebody, in, we had people in Atlanta who go out peer to peer and explain that they're doing this, they're taking it, it's working and you should think about it too. I mean, that was part of the beauty, I thought, of the self-test idea, that you know, they were able to distribute it to others. They were their own ambassadors. Same thing with people taking PrEP. That may be a model to try and replicate. One of the things we're doing with regard to the question you raise on treatment is more and more collaboration across the federal agencies. I don't think we've ever worked so closely with the CFARS, or I've spoken to HRSA as often as I do almost every day now, um, about making all of these gears start to grind together in the way that, to achieve what you're pointing out, which is right now, we have systems that are kind of operating separately, but we're, we're trying to work, and it's gonna be part of the ending the epidemic plans that we're looking for to guide folks into doing this. You know, political leadership makes a huge difference. If you can get political leaders in your jurisdiction to come on board and say, this is important for us, that brings people to the table and really can oil those gears to get them moving in the right direction. Just to add one more thing to what John said, we see this in a lot of different sectors, is the importance of integrating HIV prevention mm. and treatment and care into other aspects of individuals' lives. Because you might often hear, well, you want me to take PrEP. I, I, I have a lot of other things I'm worried yeah, about. Right. I'm, I'm homeless. You know, I'm an injection drug user. And I'm going to probably get shot sometime in the next month. So you really have to have an integrative approach, not just take HIV in isolation. We see that very often, that we've got to make sure we look at every other aspect of a person's life before we focus too much in a vacuum on HIV. Andy. Uh, thanks again for a great talk. I wanted to see if both of you could comment on, I mean, ending the HIV epidemic is obviously a huge goal. But some of the things that we've seen now, especially with PrEP use, is also now an uptick in other STDs. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, is there a plan built into this, but or just plans that we mm -hmm. already have to also treat the other STDs uh, that we're seeing this sort of mm -hmm. uptick in because of yep. PrEP? Uh, absolutely. Uh, our funds, at least from CDC, I can't speak yet to what the announcement's going to look like, but we obviously have a, a large investment in preventing STDs, uh, preventing STDs rather uh, nationwide. We want to see PrEP brought out to STD clinics. We think that's a terrific venue for us to be accessing those people who are at highest risk. Part of PrEP that we promote, and that's part of our guidelines, is routine STD screening. 
And the beauty of that is once you have a group of people at risk for something and you begin screening them regularly and treating them, you can begin to reduce that prevalence, which leads to reduced incidence. And I think some of these studies, I'm not sure the uh, final chapter has been written on this, but some of the studies that saw early increases in STDs and PrEP clinics may have been just artifact of testing all these people who hadn't been tested before. But those where they've been routinely testing every three or four months, they've seen plateaus or uh, rates yeah. going down. Andy, I think it's going to go down. Uh, yeah, I, I think, think ultimately PrEP is going to lead to a decrease in other STDs. Because if PrEP is implemented correctly when you come in and get tested and treated for STDs, it may not be in the first few months to a year, but at the end of the curve, I think it's going to start yeah, coming down. I agree with you. I think that, uh, and the, the misperception that uh, PrEP is driving STD rates up, the people who need PrEP were already engaging in the behavior that put them at risk for STDs. So if anything, as you're pointing out, it's going to bring it down, I think. And I, I would just add that we also know that there are uh, important STDs. There's a syphilis kind mm -hmm. of syndemic underway uh, in people living with HIV. Right, so it's not just a PrEP also. issue. We, we really have to address uh, STIs in, in people living with the virus. Um, we have another question. Ah, great. Carrie Altoff. Hi, Carrie Altoff from um, the Department of Epidemiology. So the goal has been set. It's been clearly defined. We love that in public health. What will be the lag between when the goal is met and when we know? Ah. What data systems mm -hmm. are we using to monitor? OK, so uh, there's been a, a cross HHS group of people working on an in a set of indicators and how they're going to be um, what, what the data sources of those indicators are going to be. Some of them, uh, the main indicators, let me see if I can recall this correctly. Uh, obviously the big indicator is HIV incidence, but there's a very long lag there. We may not know the result of that for some years to come, but we have other more proximal indicators that we can produce to help people um, sort of redirect the direction their ship is going. Among them are prep uptake, uh, lit time to uh, linkage to care, and time to suppression. And those are being drawn mostly from uh, federal data systems, but we're using particularly our surveillance systems. But part of the EHE funding, we hope, will encourage those systems to improve and make, with more rapidity, report their results. There will be ultimately a dashboard that's visible on an HHS website that posts for the nation as a whole, sort of where we are by each of the indicators I've described and others. And individual jurisdictions will be able to get their own reports as well. So let's have a caveat for everybody. If we are successful, you will start to see an increase in HIV diagnoses before you see a decrease in incidence. Thank you. Because if we are doing it correctly, we will be testing more people who are already infected, and the diagnoses will go up. We're concerned about that because we know the general public is going to say, what's this plan of yours? The diagnosis exactly. is going up. If we're doing it right, it will go up and the incidence will go down. So please help communicate to people why that's the expected epidemiologic profile of ending an epidemic. Tony, I want to thank you for that epidemiologic <laughs> insight. You've spoken was, like an epidemiologist. I've heard, I've heard they saw the same <laughs> phenomenon in both New York and San Francisco. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's not new. Decker, yeah. NIAID, and Hopkins. Uh, to that end, in terms of there's a problem now where we cannot get centralized samples of all the new diagnostic diagnosed individuals to be able to test for biomarkers of recent infection. Is there anything, since this is now a you know, government-wide initiative, to uh, either take all the new uh, blood samples from newly diagnosed people who are sure getting sent in for sequencing to have them then tested for other biomarkers or anything to collect that to be able to give the CDC the ability to better estimate the number of new infections right. or incident infections in the U.S. Yeah, I, th I, there's not much I can say about that in detail because that's something that's being worked on right now as a, a plan is in development. As some of you may know, we currently use CD4 cell count at diagnosis mm -hmm. to, uh, on a population level, not an individual level, to assess sort of where we are. Um, uh, there's been a lot of interest in revisiting uh, incidence assays, and we're uh, working on that now. There are some tough 
barriers uh, when we're working with public health, having moving specimens around from people who didn't consent to that kind of testing, and then what to do with the result, which really has no clinical utility. Um, it's solely for public health. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's something we're looking into. And could, this is an opportunity to look at it again. We, we could clone you, Oliver, and have you go to the different yeah, we, now that's <laughs> Now, that is a, that is a Tony, do you, do, you have, do you have those funds for the cloning project? <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Josh, please, and, and I think we're coming to the end, so maybe one Great, last well, first of all, thank you both for your incredible service and, and this, this initiative. Um, I wanna ask a question about the fact that um, there is HIV in immigrant communities at a time when immigrant communities may be very scared to seek medical services, in part because it may, um, under administration proposals, keep them from ever becoming citizens, or in part just because of the fear of enforcement. Um, how have you, how has that factored into your thinking when your maps overlap with areas with a lot of immigrants? Uh, so do you want to say first? Or? Well, you know, it, it's a very tough to give an answer to that. Obviously, yeah. as public health officials as you are, Josh, uh, we would like to see a, no one be denied any access to or implementation of health care based on their immigration status. To me, that's a public health mandate that should be Unfortunately, it's not being implemented, but that's the way we strongly feel, but it's not within our purview to change that. No, but, but I will say, we treat everybody who comes, right. you know, our philosophy is we treat everybody who crosses our threshold. We don't care who you are, you're part of the public, and we need to take care right. of you. Um, so whatever can be done to facilitate right. that and to right. reduce the barriers of people coming in. Right. You know, there was an interesting project in uh, Houston where this is a big issue, they have a very large uh, cross-border community, and they've engaged uh, some folks who are themselves undocumented is to go out into the community and begin to try and explain to folks that as currently stands, there's no threat, and to try and bring them into care. This is again this sort of the peer navigator model. You know, there isn't a perfect solution, right. but there are hopefully some ways we can begin to gain trust, at least to get people into care. Well, I, could, I think we have maybe, yes, Kate, time for a... Um, hello. Thank you for the presentations. My name is Melanie Reese. I'm a 20-year thriver with mm -hmm. HIV. I'm the executive director of Older Women Embracing Life. And um, when this plan first was put out, there were five pillars. Workforce development went away because the thought process, I guess, is workforce development in each one of those other four pillars is going to happen. Is there going to be funding um, that's going to allow for that workforce development? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. And by the way, is Linda Scruggs with you here today, Melanie? It's good to see you again. I don't know if she's here, yeah, but we've talked, uh, this has been a, a topic of a lot of conversation. You know, the reason it went away was, as you pointed out, we realized this is really a cross-pillar permeating issue. And by isolating it, we were afraid that we would make people feel like it was something separate from all the other things we were trying to do. That being said, you know, we hear from the field all the time, our biggest need is more people to do the work that's necessary. And as, uh, Tony pointed out, you know, it'd be great to have people who don't just focus on HIV, but who have, are multi-talented and can do a lot of other services. It's better for the public health, better for them as well, I think, professionally. There will be funds from uh, the funds from the uh, end of the HIV epidemic plan can be used, as our funds at CDC already can be used, uh, for bringing workforce on board. How that is going to be negotiated at the local level really depends on what you can help contribute to the people driving your plan to get them to do what you think is needed in your community. They're waiting to hear from you about you know, what the best thing to do is uh, and how to reach people most efficiently. Uh, we're looking at a number of different ways to try and enhance that. It's not just the public health um, uh, workforce that we're worried about. On the other side, it's the clinical workforce where a lot of people who treat HIV are aging out and retiring. And we need to find ways to bring, yeah, we're all getting older. We need to find ways of bringing into the workforce new folks who are not only interested in this, but uh, can be engaged in taking care of people for the rest of their lives living with this infection. 
That's going to have to be our last comment. All right, last one. Those of us who are long-term survivors, living long, we're aging. And there's really nothing in place, because we're the first cohort of mm -hmm. those thriving with HIV that are aging. And so, um, Dorcas Baker, do you mind if I mention your name? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, the Baltimore City HPG. Yeah, where are they uh, here? We have yeah. a coalition mm -hmm. for HIV, aging, and long-term care, where we are trying to tackle how we are going to be treated in rehabilitation, mm -hmm. nursing homes, assisted living, um, because we don't want to see what happened in the beginning right. of the uh, right. treatment happen for those of us that are aging, Yep. okay? So uh, we need funds to support our coalition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I really admire the um, attitude that you want to make sure that other people don't ever have to go through what you have had to go through. And you have a lot to teach us and uh, the workforce in how to help manage folks so that they don't face the same kinds of barriers that you previously faced. So thank you. Yeah, and I guess I would just add that, of course, when we talk about getting control of the epidemic, ending the epidemic, what we also mean, of course, is that everybody in this country living with HIV now is going to yes. live long lives. So, so the, the issue that you raise about aging and, and long-term uh, survival is, is a reality mm -hmm. irregardless of how well we do. Uh, with this Ending the Epidemic initiative, and I, I think we all know that, and that's, of course, a very important part of our CIFAR work as well. We have a very active group in aging, as you know. Uh, so with that, I'm afraid we, we have come to the end of what has really been a wonderful uh, conversation, two wonderful presentations. Uh, we really want to thank Dr. Brooks, Dr. Fauci for coming. Thank the dean again for, uh, for hosting us in this extraordinary place. I want to thank Dick Chason, the CIFAR director, for the CIFAR support and, and the team who helped so much uh, from the dean's office and from the CIFAR. And please, uh, everyone, join me in thanking these spectacular. <laughs>